It is good to be with you all on this second Sunday after Epiphany. And before we go too far, I want to thank elders Kathy Craven and Kelly Jackson for their leadership in worship this morning. From our revised common lectionary for today, we find a wonderful passage in the book of Psalms. Psalm 36, verses 5 to 10. The committee must have decided that it was too much to include the entire psalm. And indeed, the first few verses are a bit harsh. But in my heart of hearts, I can't not include them today. You see, it helps us to see the big picture. It gives us perspective. So this morning, I will be reading the entire psalm, Psalm 36, but we'll hone in on the recommended lectionary passage for today. Hear the words from the psalmist. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in their hearts. There is no fear of God before their eyes. For they flatter themselves in their own eyes that their iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of their mouths are mischief and deceit. They have ceased to act wisely and do good. They plot mischief while on their beds. They are set on a way that is not good. They do not reject evil. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the upright of heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant tread on me, or the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie prostrate. They are thrust down, unable to rise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was serving as a chaplain in a central Florida hospital system, An important part of my job was to visit the list of patients who either requested a visit or they were flagged. At the time, I didn't know why patients were flagged, but I knew the answer was always to visit the patient, assess his or her spiritual needs, address them if possible, and if needed, make any necessary referrals. On the list one day was a patient whose religious affiliation was other. And since I didn't know what other meant, I decided to ask the patient about her religious affiliation. She said, I'm Wiccan. Now, I didn't know much about her religion, so again, I asked the patient. Could you tell me more about your wicked religion? (laughs) Yep, it slipped right out of my mouth and into our sacred space. Needless to say, I got thrown out of the room that day. (laughs) As part of my clinical pastoral education, I reported the event to my supervisor and peers. You see, we also had a sacred space to share our experiences. And the process was called action reflection. The action in my case was the visit with the patient and the interaction. 
the reflection was to discuss what happened in the room, including a theological reflection. In other words, why did you say what you said? How did the patient respond? And what does my experience mean in light of my faith? My supervisor and peers then provided feedback, you know, common comments and suggestions. You can only imagine the conversation. In the first verse of our psalm, we find a reference to the wicked deep in our hearts. The psalmist is not talking about wicked religion. Rather, the psalmist is talking about the wicked in our hearts yours and mine, which I reflected on during our action reflection time after my visit to the Wiccan patient. Did I think my religion was better than hers? Were my words and actions respectful of her beliefs and thoughts? Did I value her as a person? Where was God anyway? And why on earth did I say the word wicked? I really did feel terrible about that. We should remember not to be too smug. Friends, remember Paul's words in Romans chapter 7? I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Verse 15. Well, in the first four verses of our psalm, the psalmist is describing the sinfulness of the wicked. We are all sinners. We just confessed our sins earlier because we are all sinners and we keep on sinning, which results in separation from God. So here we have the context for our passage for today. The problem is that we are sinners. In the next few verses, the the psalmist contrasts God's covenant love and mercy against the propensity to sin. Psalm 36 is really a study of contrast. The psalmist first describes the sinfulness of humanity or at least the potential sinfulness of humanity. Then, right in the middle of the psalm, it shifts to some of the most beautiful language in all of Scripture. When we think of praise and worship songs, we make these songs out of verses 5 to 9. But nobody makes a song out of verses 1 to 4. The psalm is actually divided in three sections. Essentially, we have the portrait of the wicked, verses 1 to 4, including a pretty vivid description of the wicked, the harsh verses I was referring to earlier. In the middle, we have a picture of the goodness of God, verses 5 to 9, including attributes of love, faithfulness, righteousness, and justice. What a beautiful portrait of God, right? Then we find the application of all these attributes, which extends to all of creation. Finally, in verses 10 to 12, we find a petition, a request. The prayer is to continue God's favor. In other words, a request for continued favor or blessings to those who know God and protection from the wicked. Basically, the psalmist is asking for protection from evil and to ask that God will continue to be God and to bless those who know God. Do you see how the psalm unfolds? The psalmist asks for protection from the wicked, which was described in the first few verses, and for the continuation of God's favor, which was depicted in verses 5 to 9. It's a tightly woven psalm. 
And the verses are neatly connected, which I love. The first thing we notice is the strong contrast between who God is and the wicked. In the English, we have words like evil, iniquity, and transgression describing the wicked. In contrast, we find the chief attributes of God, love, faithfulness, righteousness, and justice, with the word hesed being used three times. In the Hebrew, hesed means steadfast love, found in verses 5, 7, and 10. Hesed is the love surrounded by the promises of God, promises that can't be broken no matter what. It's a word that combines faithfulness and love. In the New Testament, it's summarized by the Greek word, which means grace. So to summarize the three parts of the psalm, the problem here is human sinfulness, the solution is God, with the psalmist praying that God continues to be God and to bless those who know God. Now, there are a lot of areas for interpretation in this psalm, including a study of the character of God, an emphasis on God caring for people and animals, God caring for all of creation, finding refuge in the shadow of God's wings for protection, the knowledge of God, and so much more. But today, I want us to focus on knowing God. How do we assure ourselves to continue with God's favor? As I wrestled with a text this past week, I think we find our charge in the petition of the psalmist. Please, God, continue your steadfast love to those who know you. Verse 10. The request is that God will continue God's hesed, God's faithfulness, to those who know God. And with that, there's a responsibility on the part of the petitioner. That's us. We know we have a problem. Namely, we are sinners. And there's a tension between being a sinner and the hesed of God. God's faithfulness, God's steadfast love. So we have a responsibility, don't we? The answer is knowing God. Not just to know more about God, but to know God more. Friends, how well do we know God? If we are honest, we have encountered God in the form of a sunrise, an unexpected blessing, a kindness from a stranger we didn't deserve, protection from the storms of life in many forms, a visit with a child of God who teaches us important lessons. But how many have taken the opportunity to reflect on what that means? How well do we really know God? I know that many of you have experienced the grace of God, God's faithfulness, God's steadfast love, in a variety of ways. And I want to challenge us to embrace the action-reflection model in our lives as a way of growing our relationship with Christ, First, we have to notice where God is in our lives. How do you experience God? What is God revealing to you about God through your experiences? What is God revealing to you about you, your true selves, the real you that God has created you to be through your experiences? Then, I think we have to take the next step, 
and be vulnerable with others. How does your experience with God shape how we relate to others? What do you learn about the community of faith? Friends, this is an invitation to share our experiences, our God sightings, or God winks, if you will, with others. As a follower of Christ, how does your experience shape how you behave? Do you see it? Action, reflection, action, reflection. How do you treat your body, for example? How do you treat others? How does the body of Christ interact? And how should we interact as a congregation, as a community, and as people of the Church of Jesus Christ? And as my supervisor always asked, what does your experience mean in light of your faith? In other words, how well do we really know God? Though I did get thrown out of a hospital room that day, my encounter with one of God's children and the reflection that followed made me a better chaplain. I learned more about myself and about the character of God. God is still faithful in spite of my shortcomings. That is good news. And as the psalmist reminds us, there's always the petition. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And today we remember and honor the Reverend Dr. King. In his autobiography, pieced together after his death from many articles and talks that he had made, Dr. King wrote about the following incident that happened during the Montgomery bus boycott. Almost immediately after the protest started, we had begun to receive threatening telephone calls and letters. They increased as time went on. By the middle of January, they had risen to 30 and 40 a day. As the weeks passed, I began to see that many of the threats were in earnest. Soon I felt myself faltering and growing in fear. One day, a white friend told me that he had heard from reliable sources that plans were being made to take my life. For the first time, I realized that something could happen to me. One night toward the end of January, I settled into bed late after a strenuous day. Coretta, Dr. King's wife, had already fallen asleep. And just as I was about to doze off, the telephone rang. An angry voice said, listen, the person called him the N-word. We've taken all we want from you. Before next week, You'll be sorry you ever came to Montgomery. I hung up, but I couldn't sleep. It seemed that all of my fears had come down on me at once. I had reached the saturation point. I got out of bed and began to walk the floor. I had heard these things before, but for some reason that night, it got to me. I turned over, and I tried to go to sleep, but I couldn't sleep. I was frustrated, bewildered, and then I got up. Finally, I went to the kitchen and heated a pot of coffee. I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. I sat there and thought about a beautiful little daughter who had just been born. 
I'd come in night after night and see that little gentle smile. I started thinking about a dedicated and loyal wife who was over there asleep. And she could be taken from me, or I could be taken from her. And I got to the point that I couldn't take it any longer. I was weak. Something said to me, you can't call on Daddy now. You can't even call on Mama. You've got to call on that power that can make a way out of no way. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. I think I'm right. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right. But Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage. Now, I am afraid. And I can't let the people see me like this, because if they see me weak and losing my courage, they will begin to get weak. The people are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and lo, I will be with you, even until the end of the world. I tell you, I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roar. I've felt sin breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus saying still to fight on. He promised never to leave me alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced him before. Almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. Martin Luther King Jr. appealed to the power of God that he found in Jesus Christ. When he was afraid, When he wanted to give up, he laid down his fears at the feet of God. And he remembered that he had a power greater than his own, on which he could rely. Reverend Dr. King knew God intimately and made his petition because he knew he was a sinner. And he also knew that God is good all the time. Friends, all of us, all of us have access to that power of God's unfailing love. Even when we remember and fail to remember, God's love for us does not fail. As it says in Psalm 36, They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. And we know, as Dr. King so eloquently said, that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hatred cannot drive out hatred. Only love 
Only love can do that. Friends, how well do we really know God? May we find the love of God in our hearts and be filled. And may we turn around to love and serve our Lord in a broken and hurting world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.